Good morning, everybody. Good, morning. Good to have everybody in the class. Uh, we're exploring the Bible, uh, and we're back to Romans today, and we're going to be looking at, actually the lesson is Romans uh, chapter 8, verses 12 through 25, but I want to do the whole chapter if I can. It, it'd be, it's, it's difficult, and probably this is one of the, you could spend a year in this chapter, uh, I'm not kidding you. There's so many things here. And and so uh, I want to say that if I had to capture the whole of Romans 8, I would call it the life of the Spirit, life in the Spirit. And this is where it's difficult to teach the Bible because it's not a carnal thing. Uh, you have to be able to move into the spiritual to understand spiritual things. And so we're comparing spiritual things with spiritual things here this morning. And it has to do with the opening, the, the work of the Holy Spirit in our life and uh, our position in Christ. Paul uses the phrase in Christ so many times in this chapter more than any other place. And so I, I do want to put that on the board because I always have to do this. It helps us, it'll help us today to see what we, we have. Uh, I'll put the cross here. I always like to do it in red, the blood of Christ. Here's the cross. And uh, we come to the cross through the gospel. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And so then we're placed into the body of Christ. This is, we will call this union with Christ. Uh, or the word in Christ. It's a little Greek word, in Christ, Christos. Christu. In Christ, all right? So how do we get into the body of Christ? 1 Corinthians 12, 13. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's no other means. There's no other way to get into the body of Christ except God put you there. You don't put yourself there, and even the local church, pastors, preachers, ministers, nobody can put anybody into the body of Christ. And in truth, no one can give you the assurance of your salvation apart from the Holy Spirit. Now, a lot of people will try to give you assurance, and we've tried to do that. The people have come to us and said, I'm, I'm not sure I'm saved, and we'll take the first John, you know, if you believe this, and then you know. But the Holy Spirit is the one who affirms and assures us that we are children of God. We'll see that in the lesson today. It's very clear. If you go back to the Old Testament, to the prophets, there was a statement that says that the false prophets cried, peace, peace, where there was no peace. So we don't want to comfort anyone in a, for, for false reasons. <clears throat> And so we have to understand that it's only God that can give that comfort. He is the God of comfort. We're told in 2 Corinthians chapter, beginning in chapter 1, the God of comfort. So we have, we have this position. This is our position in Christ. And so this in Christ, there's so many things that we enjoy as benefits and blessings. For instance, Ephesians 1, verse 3 and 4, I guess it's 3. He says uh, that, you're blessed with all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus in heavenly places. And so our position in, in the heavenlies in Christ at the right hand of the Father, we have all spiritual blessings. Uh, all spiritual blessings. And then what happens experen ex experientially, there, in other words, down here, we have, since we were saved, down here in this life, while we wait for the final stage of God's plan, which is the glory that he shall reveal in us uh, at the rapture. But down here while we're waiting, he has given us the indwelling of God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes into us at the moment of our salvation. So we have the indwelling Holy Spirit. And so therefore we can be commanded to be filled with the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 5.18. Be filled with the Spirit. And also we're told not to grieve the Spirit, not to quench the Spirit. Those are the two items, the grieving and quenching. Grieving is because of our sin. Quenching the Spirit is to put out his leadership, uh, things that he wants you to do. If God reveals to you a way that he wants you to go and you don't do that, you refuse, you quench the Spirit. But in your patterns of sin, we grieve the Spirit. So we can be filled with the Spirit, and we're called on to be filled with the Spirit in order for the Spirit to operate in our lives in the Christian way of life, to bring about fruit, and to bring about the blessings that are ours in Christ. And so we have the indwelling Holy Spirit. 
And so in Paul's writings, he will, he will show us that the Holy Spirit is in opposition to the old sin nature. So I'll put the old sin nature there because we're, we're, I'll do this in a different color. We're still in our body. This is our, we still have a body. And this body that we have is dealt with in our lesson today. It's mortal, it's called mortal body. Mortal body. And so the mortal body means that it's what you have right now seated, seated here this morning. And we do for those listening in on this, we have two or three people in here. In fact, six people. And we're properly spaced apart from everyone. But you know, we're in mortal body. Mortal means subject to death. We were born with mortal bodies. Uh, our parents were mortals. And uh, there's only one person in all of knowledge that we have of the universe, there's only one person that has right now immortality. And we're told that by Paul in uh, his writings to Timothy. There's, there, we cannot approach the light. No man approaches the light, the presence of God, except the one who has this immortality, and that's Jesus Christ. And we're to have that. He wants to give us that immortality. That awaits us. And so, but, but right now, as we're told in the previous verses here in chapter 7, Paul says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Or the body of this humiliation. So the mortal body is the body of death. And death is being worked in our body. And so we have to understand that. So with that much, uh, I think that will give us some, something to hang our thoughts on as we move through this. The first, uh, the first part of this. Now, so I, I want us to think about these two things. I'm going to try to do this uh, in a way that we can. It is a living. Uh, this would be life life right now in the spirit and then waiting for the coming glory and so this word waiting so I'm going to put this up here while we wait because you know we are waiting aren't we? while we wait you know with all this uh, coronavirus and quarantine and everything what are we doing we're all waiting mm -hmm. waiting to hopefully to get back to more freedom and this is a perfect example of what we have now. We're in, we're in waiting, too. We're waiting in this body of death. We have the life of God in us, the Holy Spirit within us. He's quickened. He's given us life and uh, in the Spirit. Our spirit has been made alive unto God. And, and, and one of the passages that we'll get into today is that His Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, bears witness with my spirit that I'm a child of God. That's your assurance. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in assuring us that we're a child of God. And so while we're waiting, he does a work in us. So what we're going to be looking at, while we wait, there's things that he's going to do for, that he does for us while we're waiting. And I'll just put a few numbers down there so we can start to think about that. All right, now, with that in mind, let me go to the first verse. He says, there is therefore now... No con the word therefore would reflect back on what the justification was, the judgment of Christ at the cross, and the basis of our sanctification that in the previous chapters. There, therefore, now, no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. That phrase is taken out of some of the newer translations because it's contained in, uh, in verse 4 below and, and some say that the scribes might have brought it up but whatever uh, verse 2 for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus have made me free from the law of sin and death for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that's why there's no condemnation for us he condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now, that's, I read a whole lot there, but how many laws do you see there? This helped me a long time ago when I realized how many laws has he talked about? All right, look, I'm going to take us back now. There's a law in verse 2. There's a law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. All right, so that's the first law. Anybody got the rest? All right, there's a law 
of the Spirit, the Spirit of, of in Christ Jesus. So there's the law of the Spirit here of those who are in Christ Jesus. And what's the next law? The law of the law, verse two, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the what law? Sin. The law of the law of sin and death. That's a law. In fact, that's the law that works in everybody. Everybody. The wages of sin is death, right? The law of sin and death is working in every person in the, in the universe. Every person. Except the Lord Jesus Christ. He was born without sin. We're born with the sin of Adam. But So that's a working law. It's, it's a real working law. In fact, it's working in you still because you're in the body. There's the law of sin and death. And then there's one more law. Verse 3. He says, For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. What law is he talking about there? That's, that's the Mosaic law. That's the Torah. Because the Torah was given. And so... To, to show what righteousness was and what was right with God, what, how you could be right with God. But it could not do something because of the weakness of the flesh. So he says in verse 3, what the law, the Mosaic law, the law of God, the righteous law of God, for what the law could not do, it couldn't do it. Why? In that it was weak through the flesh. Right here, this is the flesh, the old nature. So the old nature couldn't do the law. For righteousness. We've been through this already. You know, it's one thing about teaching Paul and the book of Romans is everything is laid down one thing upon another. You know, the therefores and, and you know, it's like here, there is therefore now. And so you keep just have to move one thing after another. It's like a lawyer writing a you know, some kind of contract, the whereas and the therefores, and finally the whereas or the therefores. And so you're going to have that. Paul goes all the way through like that. He does. And so we have to understand that we're reading something all the way through and trying to, trying to understand what the mind of Paul as he writes this, the mind of the Spirit in Paul. And so those are our three laws. Uh, I'm going to illustrate this because this has to do with everything we're going to be talking about. Uh, the law of sin and death, let's think about that like gravity. All right, so all of us are subject to gravity. We can't overcome that. There's no way you can overcome gravity. You know, if you jump off a building, you're going down. Or even we're sitting here today, we're sitting because of gravity. Or we'd just be floating around somewhere. But gravity holds us down. We can't fly on our own, can we? All right, Bob's a, a navigator. but You can't fly on your own. But there's another law. The law of thermodynamics, right? Aero the aerodynamics. The law of aerodynamics can actually lift us in a way and overcome the law of gravity. And so here it is. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. That's what we learned. So that's how he started off. Look at verse 2 again. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Now Paul has taken a lot of pains to help us see that sin, the old sin nature, no longer has a right to dominate us. The sin, the sin nature has, no longer has a dominion, a rightful dominion over us unless we give it to that. And we can give over. We can give space to the devil. You can give ground to the devil by your behavior or something you're, you, you're doing. Uh, I'm, 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 I got an illustration, but I don't know where I can give it. But, uh, you know, it's like there's people, I'm thinking of a young college kid, uh, invited Satan into, his, into her body. And uh, after 20 years, she still has visits from the demonic spirits into her body at night. And now she would not like to get rid of that. It's a sensual sexual thing. It is. And so I've heard it so many times in, in counseling. But the point is, you can give a dominion to Satan if you want to follow a feeling. I, I mentioned that last week because I see that in the, what's happening in the music field. 
Satan is the master of music, you know, and he knows how to stimulate and, uh, and, and to bring around the carnal, the carnal response. And so we, we certainly can give space to Satan. We can give space to our old sin nature. You can just give in to it and go with it, can't you? Mm -hmm. You can walk in, your, in the flesh if you desire. But God is calling us to walk in the Spirit. And, and it is true that as a believer, we have a choice. We can walk in the, in the flesh. And we'll do that from time to time. But if you are a true believer, and if you're living in the flesh, you will have the Holy Spirit's conviction. The Holy Spirit will continue to woo you back into the things of God because that's the life that he wants us to have. Life in the Spirit, he's going to draw us back to the things of God, even though we might fail or fall from time to time into sin. He's going to woo us back, and that is the work of the Holy Spirit. He makes me dissatisfied with what I've done. He can grieve with what I have done. And so I want to be back on track with the Holy Spirit's leadership. The Holy Spirit uh, gives me a love for God's Word. He gives me a, a desire to wake up in the morning and go to the Word and, and to read the Word. He gives me a desire to pray unto, unto the Father, to be thankful over and over. And so there's so many things that while we're waiting, the Holy Spirit is doing in us. Okay, So now with that, let's... Uh, Okay, we, so we have those two laws, oh, three laws. So let's think about this. This is gravity, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the Torah couldn't lift us above that because it was weak because of the old nature. So the Torah couldn't do that, but there was another law, a higher law. Uh, as we said, the law of aerodynamics that lifts us above the gravity pull, okay? And so that's what we see going on. The book of Galatians, Paul's letter to the Galatians, talks about this same kind of pull, push and pull, right? You know, when it talks about the flesh and the old nature and the Holy Spirit dwelling within us and, and are contrary one to the other, contrary one to the other, and the flesh is working out. We can do that because it comes up in the word. The, to that. the flesh works out the works. It's called the works of the flesh. In Galatians and then uh, in Galatians uh, the Holy Spirit produces the fruit we have that word today in our lesson the fruit of the Spirit see, of the Spirit the fruit of the Spirit and so we we're either going to have the works of the flesh manifest in our life or there's going to be the the fruit of the Spirit manifest in our life okay so we can, that's that's a, that's a parallel passage to what we have today <coughs> Now, in studying this, I thought the best way for me to deliver this, other than take a year to do it, is to show you what the Holy Spirit's doing in our life while we wait. So we are waiting. There's a hope that we have. He brings up that word hope over and over in the lesson. You know, he says, uh, if you hope for something, you have it. Why do you hope for it? In other words, there's something that we're hoping for that's not present with us. And the word hope is elpis, which means a confident expectation. So we're confidently expecting something. And it will be what we're con uh, confidently expecting, or waiting for, is the coming glory. And uh, he, he even talks about that in, in the lesson where the one that God has justified over here, right here, the one that God has justified, God is in the process of sanctifying and the ones that God is in the process of sanctifying, he is going to glorify. He, so the ones that are justified, he sanctifies. The one that's sanctified, he will glorify. And the glorification is when we put down this old body. The old body is put down, and we get a new body. And when we get the new body, we have full sanctification, spirit, soul, and body. Uh, that's 1 Thessalonians uh, 5.23. And that takes place at the rapture, at the coming of the Lord. I was, uh, I, I guess I can do this on the side of, I listened to uh, Parker Johnson uh, last week. I listened to a bunch of pastors. I did, you first, of course, pastor, our pastor. But uh, Parker quoted from Thessalonians, 1 first, first Thessalonians chapter 4, 
verse 16, which is a rapture passage. So I, I, you know, I sent him an email and I said, man, I loved your message today. You preached on the rapture. And uh, then he explained to me that when the rapture really was going to take place at the end of the, you know, when the Lord comes. And uh, I said, well, you'll enjoy it. He said, I'll enjoy it just as much as you will. And I said, well, sure, we will. And uh, so uh, we got different ideas about when this is going to take place. But, uh, but all together, it doesn't matter who we are or what denomination. If you're into the word, you know that there's a glory coming. We all know that we're undone right now. We're not completely done. God's not done with you. We know that. And so we're told in Colossians that we're complete in him. And that's good to know. That's up here. We're complete in him. Up here in Christ, we have absolute perfection. This is perfection. This is perfect righteousness. Perfect righteousness. We're complete in him. But down here, there's some things that still, as Paul says, we groan. We're, we suffer. We suffer down here. We groan down here. <clears throat> so there's something waiting. We're waiting for something else. We're anticipating something greater. And <clears throat> we know that we'll receive that because if he gave us his son, why would, we, why would he withhold anything else? A fortiori, it's, you know, if he, on this side, if he'd given you the, the best he has, then why would he withhold the least? And so we have that. So here, here we go. So, what if, what if we have through the Holy Spirit while we're waiting? First of all, <clears throat> we have no condemnation. And while we're waiting, no condemnation. That's the first thing. No condemnation. That's verse 1 that we read. And, and, that's, and that also is verse 29 through 34. So it's verse 1 and also verse 29 through 34. Come on, read that. And, and we'll cover that part right now. No condemnation. <clears throat> so look at verse, <clears throat> excuse me, verses 19. No, 29, verse 29. He says, for, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. And that's how I'm going to read through 34. Verse 31. What shall we then say to those things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is it that condemns? See, that's the word now. There's no condemnation. Who is it that condemns? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. All right. So if you, when you look at that, you see what God has done to bring us to the point that we are absolutely without condemnation. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. All right? And, and you say, well, I, when I read that in chapter 8 and verse 1, it says there's no condemnation to them who are, who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Well, that's true. Look at verse 9. He says, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. So, so he's, what he's saying there is this. He's looking from the standpoint of this. If, if, if the Spirit of God dwells in you, you're in the Spirit. You're in the Spirit. You're not in the flesh. Now, down here, we can have lapses going into practicing the flesh. But as God sees it, the Holy Spirit is within you. And you're in Christ, and there you have perfection. You have a perfect, pure spirit. And so we are in the spirit. And so that's the basis of no condemnation, because of we're in the spirit. Uh, I, th I think we probably have to look at three, uh, some things here. The, the scriptures, especially Paul's writing, shows that we have 
as spirit. We have spirit and we have soul. We are spirit, we are soul, we are body, we have body. And see, uh, we've already pointed out that the body, there's a lot of things wrong there. It's the body of death. And because of that, we can use our body to practice sin. And, and he tells us not to do that, but that's it. The soul is not perfected, it's being perfected. This is a going on. This is a process going on. And then the spirit is, uh, is, is complete. That's why when he says you're complete in him, this is the spirit, this is complete. This is absolutely perfect. There's no condemnation here. You have, in your spirit, there is no condemnation ever. And you have the spirit given to you through the new birth. Because before, your spirit was dead in trespasses and sin. There was, you, were, you were sensual. And nat the natural man has no spirit toward God. Now this spirit is made alive unto God and perfected. This spirit is the re work of the Holy Spirit. And so the spirit is perfect. The soul is in process. This is like Romans. We'll get to this, but in Romans 12, he says, you know, surrender your body, a living sacrifice. And then he says, uh, of, be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So that renewing of the mind is going on. But the spirit is complete, perfect, sanctified to God. The, mind, the soul is being set apart. In other words, uh, God's taking me from my minding the things of the world or being worldly minded to things that are spiritual and be spiritually minded. And that's a lifelong process. And then, uh, so that's going on. And so the body, that'll be taken care of in a moment in the twinkling of an eye when it's changed at the rapture. So you see that process, you see that's going on. So when he says there's no condemnation, this is why. Because you could, God could find a, something wrong when you're thinking. And we all have some th stinking thinking. Uh, and God can find something wrong with your practice of sin in your body. But, but that's, that's no condemnation. No condemnation. All right, so that's the first one. And that's a good one because people live with guilt and shame all the time in my counseling work. You know, people, Christians, they, they suffer from uh, their own self-condemnation. Uh, guilt and shame. You know, Clyde Naramore, who was an early psychologist before James uh, Dobson ever came along, and he used to say the reason people are, uh, the reason f people are guilty is because they are. The reason you feel guilty or feel shame is because you are guilty. Well, that's true, we are. And uh, once we understand God's word, it lifts us beyond that. All right, the next thing is this. Having believed the gospel, we live in the Spirit of God. All right, that's right here. We have life when we live in the Spirit. We live in the Spirit. And uh, that's those verses, verse 2 through 13. So let me read those. The Spirit of the Spirit, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus have made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of God might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. All right, and then going on to, to verse 7 through 13. Because the carnal mind is enmity with God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye, now this is an important passage, verse 9, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. That's our relationship to God. His spirit bears witness with our spirit. Not with my body, but with my spirit. So he says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now that, that's a period there. So we can say, take that as a thought, one statement. In other words, he said, if the spirit of God is in you, you are in the spirit. Okay? 
you are not in the flesh, but you are in the spirit if the spirit of God dwells in you. So that's our that's our take there. We have to ask the question, is the spirit of God in you? If the spirit of God is not in you, you're carnal. If the spirit of God is in you, you are spiritual. And you may do carnal things as we go back over and over that last part because we're not complete. But in heavenly places, in our relationship in union with Christ, we have a perfect relationship. No condemnation. And then he says, now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. How, how you know, you can't be close, you can't be more plainer than that. If you don't have the spirit of Christ in you, you're not of his. Verse 10. And if Christ be in you, all right, if he's in you, the body is dead because of sin. What about my body? My body is dead. Your body is dead because of sin. Christ is in you, but your body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. All right? And then verse 11, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. He shall do what? Make alive the mortal body. And that's immortality. And so we know that we're dead. Even though Christ is within us, the body is dead. But then he gives us the hope in verse 11 that that body will be raised up, quickened, made alive. And so that's what's lacking, right? What's lacking? While we wait, we groan in this body. We're going to get a new body. And then he tells us that in verse 11. Then verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. A few comments about verse 13. The death there is a spiritual death. It's like if you're going to live after the flesh, you die in a spiritual way. Uh, in other words, you're cut off from the, the life, the spirituality that you would have, and you come into a carnality. Uh, it doesn't mean that you die eternally and go to hell. It, it's, it's a spiritual death in the sense of quenching the Spirit or grieving the Holy Spirit. And you're living, but you're walking the walking dead, so to speak. But if you, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, the deeds of the body to be mortified uh, is the lust pattern and the behaviors of the old sin nature. Uh, you shall live. In other words, there's a, a quality of life here, a life in the Spirit, but it's, uh, it, it's contrary. Just like the book of Galatians now, it's contrary to the control of the whole, old sin nature. So if the Holy Spirit's going to give us freedom and life, then the old sin nature can't operate in control of us. Who's controlling you? That, that's, that's some of it. You know, what's dominating your life? What, what are you, uh, he uses the word minded. What are you minding? Uh, minding earthly things or minding spiritual things? And so to be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life. All right, so you have to have help with that. So we get that in the next statement. The next statement is, while we're waiting, we have a relationship with the Father, God the Father. We have a relationship with God the Father. And this is uh, while we wait. And remember, this is all because of the living Spirit within us. He gives us so uh, the Holy Spirit. So let's look at that. Verses 14 through 16. All right, let's read it. He says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, we've already seen the Spirit of God is in you, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage, again to fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption, whereby you cry out, Abba, Father. Aramaic is the word Abba, Aramaic, Father. It's like Father, Father. One translation is Father, Dear Father. It's not a baby talk. It's not baby talk. And uh, in verse 16, he says, The Spirit itself, it's one of my favorite passages. I quote it all the time. The Spirit it himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. All right? We are the children of God. All right? who, who, 
this, this refers to the Holy Spirit's role in making us aware that we are in relationship to the Father as sons. So we're, we're sons. <coughs> we made, <coughs> he helps us to see that we're children. <coughs> in verse 14, he says uh, that we are the sons of God. The word sons there is the word we us. This is really important. I wouldn't be giving it out. We us. It's a rough breathing mark there. H U I O S. We us. And that word, you have three different words for children in the, in the scripture in, in Greek. One is brethos. Brethos. That means a baby on the mother's breast. That's an infant. And then there's the word for children, it's the word technon. Uh, T E K N O N. And uh, that just means one that's born, born of the father, or, you know, you have children. And then this. Uh, then this word, weos, refers to the mature believer, absolute mature, you know. It'd be like if you were an adopted child and you'd reached the point where you were uh, able to receive the inheritance. And that's what God says we are. We're, he has constituted us, when he saved you, when he put you here, he put you here as weos, a, a mature son of God with no limitations, perfect, perfect righteousness. Heir of all things, heir of all things, of God and of Jesus Christ. We're told that in our passage. Down here, we can be, we can be a baby on the mother's breast, needing milk and not meat. Remember that? We can be growing as young, young men, getting stronger and stronger. But up here, where we are, down here we're technon, we're children. You see, so children have to wait to... Another point where we actually come into that inheritance, but it's already ours. And this is unique things that they're unique things that are penned in in the Greek text. All right, now so that third thing then is while we wait, we have a relationship with God the Father, and so I can call. Listen, I, when I pray, I can say I do it all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Father, Father. I pray to the Father. All prayer, all Christian prayer is addressed to God the Father. You don't pray to the Holy Ghost. You don't pray to my Jesus. You pray to the Father. You pray to the Father, and who is interceding for you? The Holy Spirit. And who is hearing that? It's in the name of Jesus that the Father hears anything. So it's, it's in the name of Jesus that we pray through the power of the Holy Spirit and we address all prayer to God the Father. That's correct. Why? The Holy Spirit has made me believe that God <coughs> is my Father. I don't pray, oh God. I don't do that. You know, when Jesus prayed, he prayed to the Father. But on the cross, when he was bearing our sins in his flesh, he cried out, my God, my God. He was taking our place. See, God is God to all, but he's Father to those who are in Christ. He's my Father. He's your Father. If the Holy Spirit is in you, because the Holy Spirit leads you to cry out, Father. Okay. And then after our sins were condemned in Christ and he died that spiritual death on the cross, then there was that lifting when he cried out, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Again, he goes back to the word Father. And so when people, you know, a lot of people know God as God, but they don't think of him as their Father, their Heavenly Father. And there's a lot of people that don't know their Father, earthly Father. And what a comforting, wonderful passage this is for anyone uh, you know, the scripture says, when my father and my mother forsake me, yet the Lord will lift me up. This is part of that familial relationship. And, and Jesus is bringing many sons, many we us, many sons into the kingdom. And uh, we share that. Now, all right, that's one. And then the next one is we suffer. You say, oh yeah, uh, we suffer in Christ uh, we suffer 
No, not in Christ, excuse me. That's not it. I knew it when I wrote it. We suffer with Christ. And this is the scriptures for that. Verses 17 and 18. Look at 17 and 18. He says, And if children, right, we are children, if children then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. That means you have an inheritance. You know, we have an inheritance, undefiled, fadeth not away. And verse 17 says, If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I reckon that the suffering of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So verses 17 through 18, we see that we're going to, while we're waiting, while we're waiting to a time when there'll be no more suffering, right? One day we can say there's no more pain, no more suffering. But in the meantime, we do suffer. Not only because of the old nature, uh, you know, the, the mortal body, you know, the, uh, the fallen state of man, you know, the groaning of the body, but also because of Christ. If we suffer because of Christ. The moment you got saved right here, you became Satan's enemy. In the angelic conflict, you became the enemy because you became a member of the body of Christ and that body is being attacked every day in the world. The name of, not just the name of Jesus, but uh, the body of Christ is being attacked all the time. Satan can't get to Jesus. He's, Jesus is at the right hand of God the Father, but he can get to you. And you have to suffer. And Paul talked about his suffering in Christ over and over. He did. And Paul knew what it was to suffer. I could go into that. We don't have time. But uh, the thorn in the flesh he was given, he suffered because of the demonic attacks. All right, so... The next thing is that we suffer. Number five is we suffer along with along with the creation. We suffer because of, we suffer with Christ because of who we are. We're in the body of Christ, but also we suffer along with the, all of creation. Verse nineteen through twenty-three. Look at that. He says, "For the earnest expectation of the creature." waiteth for the manifestations of the sons of God. Now the word creature there means creation, the whole creation. The whole creation waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. In other words, in verse 19, there's a waiting. There's an expectation. Verse 20, for the creature or creation was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who have subjected the same in hope, <clears throat> because the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. All right, so in that, uh, let's see, we get two more verses. Verse 22, for we know that the whole creation groaneth, the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now, right now in the present time. Verse 23, and not only they, the creation, but ourselves also. So we have to, so that's where he connects the whole creation and then ourselves also. And so there's some suffering that we do be, along with the creation itself. In verse 23, it makes that clear. So he says, but not only they, the creation, the whole creation, uh, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit. The redemption of our body. So what are we waiting for right there? The redemption of our body. And when it, what is that redemption of the body? Right here. The coming glory. That's the redemption of the body. Uh, that's what is that? Ephesians uh, 1, 14 maybe? Where he talks about the body will be redeemed. So what we're waiting for is the coming Lord. We're waiting, we're, we're anticipating the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ when we will be caught up. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, we'll be caught up to meet the Lord in the air and our bodies will be changed. If we're living, mortal bodies, the mor this mortal body must put on immortality. If we're in the grave, this corruptible body must put on incorruption and we'll be gathered together to be with the Lord. That's what we're waiting on. And so that's exactly what Paul is referring to here. 
the redemption of our body. Has our bo have our bodies been redeemed? No. So what is the earnest? In, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14, he says he's given us an earnest uh, of the time that he will raise the body. So it's God's given you a guarantee that he's going to raise your body. What's the guarantee? The indwelling Holy Spirit. That's the earnest money that he's put down on this body he's going to redeem. He's, that's, that's the way he stated. All right, so the redemption of our body takes place at the rapture. All right, now, what's next? Well, the next one, and I'm running out of numbers over here, so this would be number six. To wait for God to reveal, reveal us as his sons. In other words, to wait for God to make us manifest as his sons. And that's verses 23 through 25. Let me read that. Verse 23. And not only they, but ourselves. We've just read that. Redemption of our body. In verse uh, 24. For we are saved. Here we are. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why does he yet hope for? But if we hope, for that which we do not see, then do we with patience wait for it. All right. Now what that is, we're waiting. That verse 25 is what I want you to think about. We're waiting for something. And he's given us the hope. He's given us the earnest, a confident expectation. But it hadn't been revealed to us. So what are we doing? We're waiting. And what are we waiting for? We are waiting for this hope to be realized. This blessed hope. It's called the blessed hope. Mm -hmm. We're waiting for the blessed hope to be realized. That's what I'm waiting for. That's what I'm waiting for. Now, in the meantime, we have some other things. In verse uh, 26, the Spirit helps us while we wait. Look at verse 26. So this would be another number, whatever the number was, number five, six, whatever, if you're numbering things. The Spirit, while I'm waiting, and, and you know, we are waiting. We're like Paul. We've grown in this body. We've we grown as part of this creation because creation's been cursed. And there's sickness and there's, you know, there's coronavirus. There's death. There's everything in the world you can think of. And so the Spirit helps us. You see that? Verse 26. So while we're waiting, the Spirit also helps us. He helpeth our infirmities. That's our weaknesses and our, the things that we have need of. He helps us in our infirmities. For he says, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. You ever felt that way? <laughs> Didn't know what to pray. He says, but the Spirit itself, or himself, maketh intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. So here we have the Spirit helping us in our infirmities, and if we add another number, in our praying. He helps us in our infirmities, and also he helps us in our communion with God the Father, in our prayers. And that would go on into verse 27. He says, and he that searcheth, he is uh, God the Father, and he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he, the Spirit, maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And so the Holy Spirit is making intercessions for the saints according to the will of God. Now, here's one more. Uh, how many numbers we got, Ronnie? Six. Eight. We're at number eight? Number All right, we're at number, number eight. Nine. Number nine. nine. Number nine now, number nine. While we're waiting, he is in every circumstance of our life. He is working in every circumstance of our life. And that would be verse 28. He says, and we know that all things, right? All things. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to his purpose. Not all things are good, but all things are worked together for good 
for the believer. So that's why we're waiting. He's making all things work together for good, according to his own plan for our life. All right? And then in verses, uh, verse 30, I'm going to skip to verse 34, because I already read that. Go to verse 34 now. It's the next one. That'd be number 10, right? Okay, number 10. Verse 34. Christ makes intercession for us. While we're waiting, Jesus Christ is interceding for us. We've already saw how the Holy Spirit intercedes. But in verse 34, he says, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, he is living again, risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also does what? Makes intercession for us. So we know that the Holy Spirit is interceding through prayer and for the saints according to the will of God. We also have Christ himself in intercession for us. He's our great intercessor. He's a great high priest, if you want to say, because Paul doesn't use that terminology. All right? So Christ makes intercession for us at the right hand of the Father. All right? This will be our last one, okay? This is number what? 11. Number 11, okay. The last one is this, and in this precious, this is so good. Uh, number 11, we have eternal security. While I wait, I have eternal security, and nothing can separate us from the love of God. All right? So if we were writing this up, we would put number 11, eternal security, and nothing can separate us from the love of God. Now let me read that. This is our, and we'll close. Beginning in verse 35, going all the way through 39. He says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, or coronavirus? As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. Talking about the prophets. Uh, we are counted as sheep for slaughter. Nay, he says, No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Right here. We can just put it this way. If this is you, if you're in Christ, nothing can ever take you out of that. You can't be taken out of that. Nothing. Nothing at all. Not anything present, not anything coming. You know, we're living right now in a time when, you know, I'm 70, I'll be 75 next month. And, you know, in 75 years, I've never seen anything like this. And it, and it caused you to wonder and doubt. And you don't know what the future is going to be like. You don't have the assurance that we once had. You know, growing up in the 50s or 60s, things were rocked along pretty good. Of course, Bob, you were in Vietnam, so that, that might not have been the case. But uh, things are so, there's so many doubts in it and fears. People are doubting and fear. Anxiety is pretty, pretty great. They're telling us right now, with the lockdown across the nation, that domestic violence is way up and suicide is way up. And, and, and plus the fact that people who suffer from anxiety is way up. And, you know, wow. We need the message, don't we, mm -hmm. of, of what we have in this lesson here, this very lesson. Mm -hmm. And you know what it takes to take this lesson to heart? It's the Holy Spirit in you. It's faith. He'll work faith in you. Faith is work within you uh, and brings about the comfort of faith the joy and the comfort that he gives. Amen. While we're waiting, God is working. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. We just pray, Lord, that you'll enable us to receive it with uh, comfort and joy and uh, that the Lord Jesus Christ might be glorified as we wait for the coming glory that you will be revealed within us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.